hello, that was an ayahuasca vine. It's growing up into this cacao tree behind me, which is amazing because cacao is, of course, another one of the uh, master plants, the uh, plant teachers that is held sacred uh, here in South America. So to have this ayahuasca vine growing up into the cacao tree is, is pretty cool. So I chose this spot to um, teach you guys about the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram. The Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram is sort of a rudimentary um, ritual that can be used as a meditation device. Um, it's used to prepare for just about any magical operation in the Western mystery tradition, uh, whether it's the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn or one of Aleister Crowley's schools or the OTO. Uh, before any ritual like the Middle Pillar, um, the banishing is used to clear the energetic space and create the proper conditions to um, facilitate uh, efficacious workings of the ritual. It's also prescribed to uh, aspiring ma magicians um, during their first year to, to perform it twice a day, once in the morning uh, with the invoking and at night with the banishing. And the idea is that you are performing the invoking uh, version in the morning in order to draw the energies that will serve you uh, into your circle that represents your universe, those energies that you are going to allow into your universe, uh, which is defined by the perimeter of your magical circle. And uh, the pentagrams are protective shapes that are used to uh, mitigate the um, coming and going of these energies uh, with their presence and with their geometry. I use this ritual before any plant medicine ceremony. Uh, when I talk about syncretic spiritual um, approach, uh, this is a really good example. Uh, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous throughout all traditions really to create a sacred circle, whether you're talking about the Diné in North America when they were having a wisdom council to make decisions uh, uh, about uh, what the tribe should do, um, <clears throat> or an ayahuasca circle, or you know, you look at Stonehenge, uh, and these circles basically had the same symbolic uh, purpose to define the perimeter of the universe of the people, um, and also to unify uh, their will. And so, when we're drawing an individual circle for ourselves, um, it's that's the purpose. The only difference between invoking and banishing is the direction uh, which you draw the pentagram. Drawing the pentagram will at first be done only with your finger. Um, this is a tradition from the Hermetic Mystery Schools. Um, you will use a magical weapon, a dagger typically, uh, later on to trace the pentagram. And you're going to visualize in your mind's eye a blue light as you're tracing the shapes and connecting the pentagrams. I don't wanna to get too deep into the technical uh, aspects of the operation because we're going to do a part two where I'm actually gonna do the demonstrations. You guys can check that out by becoming patrons. So when performing any magical ritual, it's really important that you know why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, Alistair Crowley once said that the words in a magical spell or in a ritual are really not important. It's about the intent behind them. Our consciousness is basically uh, interplay of electromagnetic, electromagnetic energies. And so the will is really what is going to compel uh, the chaotic energy to order uh, in conformity with our will. Before the Kabbalistic cross, uh, there is the Hermetic Lord's Prayer is recited, and there are a lot of different versions of this, but the beginning is almost always the same. And the way that I was taught in the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn to prepare is with a fourfold breath, which is very basic pranayama. Um, in pranayama, the breath is uh, measured for a certain count as you're inhaling, it's retained for a certain count, it's exhaled. Uh, for a measured count and then it's kept distended for uh, a measured count. In this case those counts are four and it is a helpful mental exercise to um, as we're inhaling to focus on the, um, the the consciousness, the energy, the feeling that we associate with positivity and progress and growth and all of these things that we're drawing into our being. Um, and as the breath is uh, retained, uh, we're focusing on um, instilling and integrating 
those energies into our being and consciousness because oxygen is the fuel that allows the brain to do its neurological wiring. And so while the breath is um, retained, we're flooding the brain with oxygen and allowing it to, um, giving it enhanced neurogenesis uh, uh, capabilities. And then we're exhaling the breath while focusing on those things which do not serve us and releasing them. And then we're keeping the breath distended. And it's very important that we get all the way down into the very deepest part of the diaphragm and expel every last bit of breath. And that we do all of this in very evenly measured counts of four. And while we're doing this, we're going to imagine ourselves expanding and expanding and expanding and expanding until we have risen. The earth is going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, your house will disappear and then the city will disappear. And then you can see the whole continent and then the whole planet. And then you're in the stars, but you're going beyond the stars. You're going to become larger than the universe, bigger than the macrocosm. You're going to bust through the veil so that you can access the divine light of Keter. And so the ritual begins with the uh, Kabbalistic cross. And the Kabbalistic cross is not the cross of Christianity. It is an exploded cube that represents the universe. And so with arms outstretched, eyes closed, usually tilt my head back, uh, first we perform the Kabbalistic cross. And um, again, the demonstration, I'll actually go through it, but I will explain um, the words Ata. Um, Vegebera, Vegedula, um, Leolim, Amen is basically the uh, Hermetic Lord's Prayer. Um, yours is the power, the glory, um, the kingdom forever and ever. And after the Kabbalistic cross is performed, uh, which is about basically drawing the divine light of Keter, the Ayan Sof, down from beyond the veil into um, the pineal gland or the crown chakra and down in through the rest of the sephirot or the chakras uh, in the body. And it's interesting, by the way, and we'll get into this in later videos, that the um, chakras do roughly correspond to uh, sephirot in the Adam Kadman, the macrocosmic man. So once we've expanded to the absolute maximum that we can, we have merged with the Godhead in essence. Um, that is basically the uh, real purpose of this visualization is to become one with the Godhead. And this is not really uh, an imaginal exercise. This is a state that we already have and we are just trying to realize it consciously because in reality, we are all just a fragment of that divine being and therefore equal to the Most High God. Our will is sovereign. And so this is basically functioning only as a reminder of that truth. And so again, the Kabbalistic cross is performed the divine light is drawn down into the pineal gland. And again, during the demonstration, I'll go through that step by step. And then the pentagrams are drawn. And um, there are different names of God that are associated with each of the pentagrams and also with each of the directions. And this is very important because the uh, potential aspects of consciousness that we are trying to uh, process and integrate throughout our lives uh, are they come in myriad forms and so we have um, in the, in the direction uh, ahead of us which will start to the east we have the tetragrammaton yod hey vav hey these are the four uh, letters of the Hebrew alphabet that uh, represent the holy unspeakable name of God that no one is even supposed to try to pronounce so Jehovah and Yahweh and all of these things are not even really uh, approximations of the pronunciation it is just a lame attempt at pronouncing the tetragrammaton, which actually has nothing to do with the pronunciation of this word you're not even supposed to try to speak. And each one of the symbols, each one of the letters of the tetragrammaton represents an element, and one of the four elements. And Hebrew is a very powerful uh, tool for uh, magical practice. That's why it's used uh, ubiquitously throughout the Western mystery tradition, no matter what school uh, you're talking about. And so each of these characters is this is a compressed uh, vector of meaning. It's very much reminiscent of Terence McKenna's idea of a new and higher symbolic form of language that will uh, facilitate uh, higher means of expression as our consciousness evolves. And so Hebrew seems to be an early precursor to the eventual evolution of this kind of higher form of language. And it fits very nicely into uh, our magical toolbox as it allows us to 
once again can uh, layers of meaning into a symbol symbol. And so what we're doing basically is we're compounding symbols and concressing them into one idea. And that idea is the pentagram. So we're going to have four pentagrams ultimately, one associated with each direction and a different god name that's associated with a different element. And the first one, the tetragrammaton, uh, the four elements, this is um, that element of consciousness, which is the organizing principle, which uh, compels chaotic energy uh, to arms and sim to order and symmetry uh, by force of our will, which is really just electromagnetic energy. And so um, this is the uh, association that we're making when we are um, vibrating the God name yod Hey vav Hey, and we're going through uh, you have to know the um, sign of the enterer and the sign of silence um, and the enterer we're going to place our hands above our head and grab the white light of Keter and step forward and charge the pentagram and in our mind's eye we're going to visualize this white or blue light streaming forth and charging the pentagram until it's glowing bright blue um, and while vibrating the the yod hey vav hey and again I will demonstrate all of this later and what we are doing in this moment is compelling uh, events, circumstances, experience to conform to our will, our expectations. And it is doing so with our permission. Um, and then we're moving on to the south, which is the god name Adonai. Adonai is Hebrew for Lord. And this uh, direction is associated with fire, with the sun, with creativity, with sexuality. And so... Um, depending on whether we're invoking or banishing, all of those ideas that are relevant to our life at the time, we're either going to be drawing them into the circle for invoking, or we're going to be expelling the things that we have picked up during the day that do not serve us that are associated with fire and sex and creation and light and masculinity and all of these things that are associated with the East. And then we are turning to the South. And the God name that we are vibrating is Aheye, which is I am. This is the primordial thought. This is that moment that destroyed the nothingness and introduced duality. This is the realization of self as an existing eternal energy, as a fundamental reality, as the fundamental reality. And so all of these associations with self, with identity, with, um, with self-realization, uh, okay. And then also in the direction of AAHEA is like the intellectual ideas, information. And the final direction is north, and it is uh, associated with water. The name is Agala, which is a notericon um, of another uh, prayer. It's um, basically a declaration of um, acknowledgement of divinity, Agala. And so in this direction, uh, is the emotional um, and the um, material and the feminine and uh, and so we are either drawing in those things that we wish to bring into our circle to service again or dispelling them so we're getting rid of anger and sloth and greed and jealousy and pride and all of this bullshit the seven deadly sins or whatever it is that's plaguing you and we're drawing in joy and abundance and um, and wealth and health and all of these sort of things and then on top of all of that we have another association that we're making with each of the directions and so after we've gone through all this we're going to invoke the four archangels and so each one of them also has a whole set of associations and uh, I'm gonna make a video that goes through all of that in detail probably all 12 uh, but there are there is an archangel for each of the zodiacal signs, and this is really what uh, the 12 disciples of Christ around the 13th and some type of sun, thing. So, the Gimel is a camel, Dalit um, is a door, and Bet so is a house, what it represents in this context is numerical these value. different archetypes of consciousness. And so, um, you could think of it as sort of like a um, radio dial. And so, as we're moving around the spectrum, you have uh, various stations or archetypes of consciousness. And so these archangels really sort of represent these frequencies. And so assuming the uh, form of the Kabbalistic cross again, we're invoking Raphael before me. And this is healing. 
uh, which is, you know, something that is a product of the interaction of the various forces that we refer to as the four elements. Um, so earlier when I referenced this uh, compounding of symbols into uh, a single idea um, so that we basically turn this ritual into a file cabinet of consciousness that allows us to organize uh, and to um, deal with and integrate uh, a wide spectrum of ideas uh, with practice in a single gesture, in a single sentence. There's so much compressed into these gestures and directions and symbols that um, this really what gives us the power that lies in the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. Um, and so uh, Raphael is before us. At my right hand, Mikhail, uh, Michael in English. Uh, this is the archangel with the flaming sword that supposedly kept Lucifer out of the Garden of Eden. So this is protection, uh, fundamentally. And again, I'm not gonna go too deeply into all of these archangels because that's a, an entire subject for an entire video. Um, and if you wish to really consider them actual beings, watchers atop towers is uh, one way that they're visualized in this tradition. That's all good for me. I just think of them as, um, as archetypes of consciousness, uh, as various formats of consciousness. And so after Mikael at the right hand, behind me, Gabriel. Gabriel means uh, um, the strength of God or the might of God. And it's sort of this guardian warrior energy uh, that has your back. It's behind you protecting again, similar to uh, Michael, but um, with sort of a different set of priorities. And to your left is Oriel. And Oriel oversees uh, fertility and wealth and abundance. Uh, he's usually robed in earth colors. Uh, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, uh, the Stella Mathatina that I was initiated into, uh, one of the things they do to demonstrate to you the power of these rituals is that they will give you a sealed envelope. And uh, one of the practices that you are told to engage in when you're doing the Lesser Banishing Ritual is a pentagram, a magical journal from the time that you start or take initiation. All of your dreams are written down as soon as you wake up. Uh, you're supposed to take note of things like the weather and astrological signs and, um, you know, every detail that you can think of and uh, your dreams because you're mapping the subconscious and you would be, you will be, if you do this, really surprised to see the kind of things that bubble up, precognitions that you're able to actually um, document. It's certainty and not faith. You... Uh, it's not like you have these vague memories of, didn't I dream that this happened? No, you have written it down. And also there are things that happen during ritual that appear in the mind's eye that uh, you know you write down in documents so that you have like a map of your subconscious. And so there are there is, there is a certain vision that people often have in association with Oriel. And I'm not gonna ruin it for you and tell you but in my case, I had this vision of this archangel surrounded by these things that show up sometimes, uh, which have no obvious association. Um, and then when, uh, because your superiors will review your magical journal every once in a while, when they see that you've had that vision, they tell you to open the envelope and you find out that they knew what you're going to see in association with this archangel. And so that really opens up a lot of questions and kind of gives you some confirmation that there's something to all of this, that it's not just imagination um, and that there's some sort of process uh, and that there's something deeper uh, that the, these rituals are unlocking and creating a connection to some greater mind or something. Um, okay, so a little bit of word of warning. Uh, these rituals do have effect and um, it's quite a surprise when you uh, open the third eye, when you pierce the veil, when you uh, take initiation, which sometimes can come just on the rays of the sun. You don't necessarily even need an earthly agent. Even Albert Pike, the great Freemason, uh, once said that there are many Masons of the highest ranking that have never stepped foot inside a lodge. And it is because it is this a uh, state of consciousness that really is accessible to anyone under the right circumstances and given the right constitution of that individual. 
And so these experiences that come with these practices like synchronicity, precognition, uh, they're very dangerous. And that is why uh, these secret societies existed, these uh, hermetic mystery schools, in order to give people the guidance that they need to protect them uh, from their own minds. And uh, once you start to have this expanded capacity of consciousness, it's very easy to get lost in it. Another thing that happens with the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, because it's, it's consciousness expansion basically with rocket fuel thrown on the fire. Uh, so what would normally occur through processes of meditation or taking psychedelics is very, very rapid. So if you are using my syncretic approach, uh, or perhaps you've devised this on your own, of combining meditation with psychedelics and ritual magic, you're going to find yourself moving extremely rapidly, which is really, I mean, a good analogy is if you were riding a bicycle and you crash, you're going to get a scraped knee. If you're driving a Lamborghini 220 miles an hour and you crash, you're going to die. So that's really valid and it's something to take to heart and be prepared because if you start really performing the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram uh, with uh, the proper approach and good technique and consistency, you will find relationships start to disappear, your job might explode in your face, and at first it can seem like the destruction, the tower is falling. Um, it's uh, a complete, uh, completely chaotic disorganization of your life and it's actually a good thing and you just have to have patience and you have to have perseverance because in order for a new order to emerge uh, there must be chaos you have to create space for there to be um, the possibility of movement so that the events and the constituents of your reality can reorder and reassociate themselves in order to create something new and better and higher and as you elevate in your consciousness and create a new internal landscape uh, you will find that the external world will in fact conform to that in ways that will surprise and delight and terrify and confuse you so um, I'm always there uh, my patron page has um, uh, you can buy blocks of time uh, if you're going through this process and you need some guidance um, also, I'm available if you have uh, short questions, reasonably short questions, you know, if it doesn't take a half an hour, um, always feel free to send me an email or to say what's up on Facebook or whatever. Um, and also, if you want to see the actual demonstrations and the rest of this course, uh, you're going to have to join uh, my Patreon uh, for, for the next two months. Uh, as I'm creating the course, it's going to be available to anyone at $10 or more. After that, I'm going to raise it to $50 a month once the whole course is there. So um, get in now while it's still cheap. Um, and just remember, you guys, if you have set foot upon the path, you've taken the blue pill and there's no turning back. So uh, there are two things that are essential to keep you safe, and they are meditation and the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. The next thing to integrate into it is the middle pillar ritual, but I think that it's important to be proficient at the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram uh, before um, adding the middle pillar, which is basically uh, uh, drawing the divine light into each of the sephirot or chakras that are in the center of the body um, in order to imbue the speech, the mind, the heart, the sexual organs, uh, and the feet with um, divinity so that they all act in accordance with your highest self and your highest purpose and that all of your movements and thoughts and speech are sacred. So yesterday we noticed that this ayahuasca vine that I had been sitting on to film a segment the other day is host to a bunch of these things. Bullet ants, the most painful bite of any insect. People that have been shot say that they uh, would rather be shot again. So I had this idea to do the uh, bullet ant challenge. If anyone will donate a thousand dollars, I will let one of these bullet ants bite me on camera. I'm trying to get one to bite the stick so you guys can see how gnarly their mandibles are. I mean, they are scary creatures. And we have, as you can see, plenty of them. There you go, see that? Yeah. Oh, it was off camera. Let's see if I can get one of them to bite. So you can see. I oh, hear how I you hold it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try to get one of them to bite so you can see how. 
them. Is there anybody loose anywhere? They're all just like sleeping here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can tell they, yeah, there it goes. Ooh, did you see that? Did you get it? I think so. Okay, here, as close as you can get it. Yep, see those pinchers? Did you get them? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Cause I can 